Uh, no, thank you so much uh, to you all as our moderators and to Sages uh, for the opportunity to give the talk. Um, it's not updated on the app, but I'm actually at uh, George Washington in D.C. Oh, I'm uh, so sorry. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, Congratulations. No, thank you. <laughs> um, so, again, thank you for the opportunity to give this talk. I have no disclosures. So technological advances in, in surgery have really revol revolutionized how we diagnose and treat uh, many clinical problems. Uh, and, and those advances have really led to a shift uh, in, in focus towards organ preservation, which is the overall theme uh, of this forum today. Uh, this is a, a great but uh, very broad topic to cover in, in 12 minutes, so I chose to kind of briefly focus on the diagnostic and, and therapeutic advancements that we've made over the years in endoscopy uh, as it relates primarily to Barrett's esophagus, uh, esophageal cancer, uh, and early gastric cancer. So in order to really talk about uh, some of these advances, I think it's important to really reflect on the catalyst for some of the big paradigm shifts uh, that we're seeing in terms of the management of esophageal and gastric lesions. In terms of the esophagus, uh, esophagus adenocarcinoma, esophageal adenocarcinoma uh, is currently increasing at a rate uh, greater really than any other cancer currently. And historically, uh, the treatment for esophageal cancer, uh, even high-grade dysplasia, was uh, esophageal resection. So uh, while there has been a shift towards minimally invasive esophagectomies uh, over the last several years, uh, the procedure is still really associated with uh, steep learning curves uh, and considerable morbidity. So because of the increased prevalence uh, and the associated morbidity of the esophagectomy, uh, in the last two get decades or so, we really shifted our focus towards more accurate, earlier diagnosis, um, preservation of the anatomic and, and physiologic structure of the esophagus, um, with an ultimate goal of hopefully reducing morbidity, improving our long-term survival, uh, and improving our quality of life. So in, in terms of accurate and earlier diagnosis, uh, historically, uh, again, uh, and, and, in, and in this case, historically, it's, it's not even that long ago, we're talking 10 to 15 years ago, esophagectomy was recommended for high-grade dysplasia. Uh, and really the main reason for that was because a large subset of resection specimens actually had uh, cancer in addition to the high-grade dysplasia when you removed it. So the paradigm was that you really needed to do an esophagectomy in case you know the disease was worse than you thought. So now some of the newer imaging techniques that we'll talk about, uh, we have uh, really allow for us to have greater diagnostic accuracy. So we're moving from what might be there to treating what we know uh, is there. So let's talk a little bit about uh, Barrett's uh, esophagus. So the current standard uh, of care in terms of uh, evaluating for Barrett's is an endoscopic evaluation that's performed with um, high definition white uh, light endoscopy with four quadrant uh, random biopsy specimens. And you're going to take those every one to two centimeters, and that's described by the, well by the Seattle protocol. So this is the current standard of care, but you know this approach is really subject to sampling error and decreased uh, adherence to practice guidelines. Um, and even though there have been improvements in white light endoscopy in terms of high definition uh, technology. Dysplasia with Barrett's uh, really can be more difficult to identify when you're just using white light endoscopy. You can miss anywhere upwards from 10 to 40 percent of high-grade dysplasia or early esophageal cancer. So this really has led to, uh, us to develop other diagnostic tools that are going to allow us to visualize these lesions better uh, and potentially move away from untargeted biopsies. So chromoendoscopy is one such tool, and that's going to improve our visualization of mucosal lesions by using things like dyes or weak acid or um, integrated image filters in terms of virtual chromoendoscopy to, to really help us identify these suspicious lesions. And each of them ha have demonstrated an ability to identify high-grade dysplasia and early cancer uh, with fewer biopsies than white light endoscopy alone. Um, but you know, we are still missing some dysplasia, uh, even with these technologies. Uh, the literature says anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 percent of high-grade dysplasia and early cancer will be missed. Um, and that's the, the thought process with, with uh, this is that inadequate or unequal uh, surface application of the either the acetic acid or the Lugol solution um, can create inconsistent uh, results. So this can lead to missed dysplasia, and, and that's really a limitation here. 
One of the other tools is a confocal laser uh, endomicroscopy. So this is as if you're bringing the microscope into the endo suite, right? So it's gonna allow direct um, microscopic analysis of the mucosa at the cellular and the granular levels to really evaluate the architecture. Um, all this can help you uh, with real-time decision-making uh, in the endo suite. So this is gonna allow you um, uh, again, to make real-time decisions. And so a multi-center randomized trial by Dubnar and colleagues really showed improved sensitivity for high-grade dysplasia uh, when compared to white light endoscopy. Um, but again, there are some concerns regarding sampling errors um, <clears throat> given that CLE really only images a small field of the esophageal mucosa uh, at a certain time. So in that same randomized trial, uh, high-grade dysplasia was missed in 5% uh, uh, of patients. So there's still uh, some work to do, uh, which brings us to kind of the, oops, I'm sorry which brings us to the newest kind of uh, imaging technology uh, that's, that's out, uh, which is volumetric laser endomicroscopy. So VLE is gonna really use advanced kind of optical coherence uh, tomography to produce scans of a larger segment of the esophagus. So while, while CLE is looking at a smaller area, VLE is really gonna allow you to see uh, upwards of six centimeters of uh, segments of the esophagus. So this is a high speed scan that's gonna allow real time diagnosis of some of the surface uh, and subsurface abnormalities. And this can help you uh, guide uh, in your endoscopic treatment. There have been some initial studies that, that are showing fe uh, feasibility of identifying Barrett's-associated neoplasia that's not identified by white light endoscopy or, or narrow band in imaging, um, but larger studies uh, and more comparative studies are, are really gonna be needed to see where this truly fits in uh, with helping from a, a diagnostic standpoint. So this is just a summary. I know there's a lot going on on this uh, slide. Uh, this is a summary of some of the diagnostic techniques. And I think the key takeaways are, are really the limitations, which is that uh, despite significant improvements, uh, we still are missing uh, some dysplasia. Uh, and we need to be testing these techniques uh, in more patients to kind of adequately study their effectiveness. Uh, and then lastly, uh, with respect to the VLE and, and CLE, uh, these technologies are so advanced that uh, they actually require pretty significant specialized training um, um, and so currently, right now, they're really limited to, to large academic centers. That said, um, these techniques have really provided better and more accurate um, diagnosis that's allowed us to be more comfortable with preserving the esophagus and thereby doing less radical uh, treatment. So our, again, our treatment paradigm has shifted from treating what might be present to treating what we know is present, which has given rise to uh, local therapy. So there are several uh, endoscopic local treatment options. We just had a great talk uh, on EMR and EST and the colon. Um, so several local treatment options have, have been recognized as safe and effective therapies, um, and they are now standard of care in many uh, expert centers. I'm going to spend some time talking about uh, EMR and ESD uh, in particular because they've really moved us far away from esophagectomy in patients with high-grade dysplasia or early uh, esophageal cancer. So again, EMR was initially started in Japan for management of, of gastric cancer. Um, however, it's now you know, being increasingly used for, for carcinomas all over the GI tract that's confined to the mucosa and the submucosa. So not only for its uh, therapeutic benefits, but, but also for its diagnostic uh, value in staging and uh, ascertaining uh, the depth of lymphovascular um, invasion, uh, determining your degree of uh, differentiation. In terms of the esophagus, um, there's a 90% eradication uh, of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus, um, an 80% eradication in patients who have some of the higher risk characteristics like um, lymphovascular evasion, and it's also excellent for, for the eradication of, of T1 in cancer uh, with a little less than a 2% uh, recurrence rate. Similarly, uh, ESD uh, was introduced by a Japanese endoscopist uh, for, for early gastric cancer. Um, and over the ensuing uh, kind of decades, it was introduced in the 80s actually, um, ESD has really evolved into this advanced endoscopic uh, procedure, which really should be thought of as a surgery. You know, we kind of do similar things that we're gonna be doing uh, in the operating room laparoscopically, robotically, um, and that it's very precise, um, you can obtain margins, uh, and this has really changed the landscape in, in terms of what's possible 
um, not just for esophageal lesions, but as we saw, uh, lesions in the colon, lesions in uh, the stomach. So uh, before we talk about gastric cancer, I just want to highlight that the, the adoption of EMR and EST has really uh, sim uh, significantly narrowed uh, the, the indications, the current indications for esophagectomy. Uh, and they've narrowed them down to, to really just those who have some type of recurrence with endoscopic resection uh, or those with locally uh, advanced esophageal cancer. So any tumor that's going to extend into the middle or lower third of the uh, submucosa uh, given uh, the high risk of, of lymph node metastases, those are going to be candidates for uh, esophagectomies. And, and as we continue to get better with EST, um, you know, those indications may continue to change. So uh, gastric cancer, common cause of cancer-related mor mortality worldwide. Um, uh, it's significantly more prevalent uh, in the East, but uh, we are seeing it more uh, here in the West. And an early gastric cancer is really going to be defined as kind of tumor invasion that's limited to the mucosa or the submucosa, regardless of, of lymph node involvement. So when cancer is limited to the, to the mucosa, the five-year uh, specific survival is excellent. It's 99%. Uh, and your risk of lymph node metastasis is 3%. So with submucosal involvement, that changes a little bit, but still excellent, and 96%, uh, and your risk of lymph node metastasis goes up to 20. Um, <clears throat> with uh, some of the development uh, of the endoscopic imaging techniques that we just talked about, um, we are finding gastric, early, uh, gastric cancer earlier, um, which is going to be critical to, to our outcomes, and, and it's especially because it's associated with such a favorable prognosis. So similar to the esophagectomy, um, because of the excellent prognosis, there's really been this shift to minimize the invasiveness of, re of resection. So EMR, ESD, your laparoscopic and robotic approaches are all going to be treatment options, uh, and we're going to focus on ESD uh, just in the interest uh, of time. So in centers who have experience with, with ESD, and, and we saw some great videos of it, uh, this technique is really the procedure of choice uh, in patients with early gastric cancer. Um, in a retrospective uh, study of long-term outcomes and, and nearly 500 patients, um, patients who underwent uh, ESD, the post-treatment five-year survival was, was 83%, and your local recurrence was very low, 1% uh, of patients, and your metachronous for, uh, uh, recurrences were observed in about 8% of cases. So um, now most of the literature is moving towards ESD and it's finding that it's more advantageous than EMR for some of the similar reasons that we talked about in the previous talk, but really it's going to permit a larger uh, M-block resection of larger tumors. It's going to allow for, for a deeper resection margin uh, in patients who have submucosal involvement. Um, and it's been shown to have a higher, you know, complete resection rate. So you're not removing it in piecemeal. You're removing the entire specimen. And then your recurrent, recurrence-free uh, rates are going to be higher uh, when compared to EMR. So, so just to kind of uh, think about future directions, I think ESD really is uh, the future in terms of esophageal and gastric lesions. I think, unfortunately, we're still very limited in terms of uh, who can perform these procedures and where uh, we can perform them. Um, so we really need uh, patient screening programs for esophageal and gastric cancer, uh, and really an increase in the number of training programs that kind of focus on these diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. Um, in order to kind of move us toward or closest, uh, closer towards kind of more targeted biopsy protocols. Um, there are some protocols that are out there, but they have not yet become standard of care. Um, and, 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 and to continue to move us uh, towards potentially expanded uh, indications for, for ESD. Uh, this really has to be a collaborative effort uh, between a surgery and GI. Um, in order to kind of maximize our ability to really push innovation forward and, and continue towards uh, organ preservation. Thank you. Great, thank you.